Hey everybody. So this is Miss Corey. We're going to talk about uh, U7L6, women in the Middle Ages in Eastern Orthodox Church. So your job, you're going to watch this Ed Puzzle. Um, I don't have anything highlighted in red, um, but I will ask you four questions throughout this Ed Puzzle and you need to answer those four questions on your study guide. Um, I'll let you know when to write it. Hopefully I will. Hopefully I won't forget. I don't know. Hmm. We'll do this. All right, learning targets. You're going to identify the role of women of upper and lower classes, identify laws directed at women in the Middle Age Europe, describe the similarities and differences between Western Europe and Byzantine Empire, and describe the similarities and differences between Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. All right, so in this presentation, I have split this up into two parts. The first part is going to be about women in the Middle Ages, and the second part is going to be about the Eastern Orthodox Church. So it's pretty much like two little mini lessons into just one video. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to learn about women in the Middle Ages, because you know me, I always like to put in women's history into my curriculum, because uh, your textbook does a terrible job of that. All right, so why were women labeled inferior? So a lot of it has to do with religious influence, uh, specifically in the Middle Ages. That's going to be with Christianity. Um, so popes, the priests, any men of power deems women very inferior. Uh, they use the justification of the biblical story of Adam and Eve, because Eve was the one who like took the apple of sin or whatever. Um, I gave it to Adam, so they're like, oh, women are bad because they trick men into sitting. Okay. Uh, it is a very common theme throughout medieval art. Um, you'll see it everywhere, uh, the whole like concept of Adam and Eve. Uh, and then ruling men thought that women should just be like the Virgin Mary, which is a, um, who Virgin Mary was like the mother of Jesus, according to Christians. Um, so you'll see like a lot of art um, where it depicts Mary. Um, they thought that women should be like her because she was really religious, she was devout to God, and she raised her son, but raising kids was a really big women's role back in the Middle Ages. All right, so besides upper class, uh, women were not literate, or at least typically not. Uh, that means they can't read or write. And there's also that leads to like no training of ideas long distances uh so the women were really confined to only the like the little village especially if they're peasants like they only talk to the people in their like little village that the lord controlled um there was no other spreading of ideas when it came to pre peasants um and this is the same reason why peasant men weren't literate either so just like in ancient Rome, much of the Middle Age history is written by men. Um, there are examples of women's written work. You're going to be reading one of them next unit. Uh, it's a fable. It's actually pretty interesting. So what do you think was the role of wealthy women in Middle Age Europe? So for the wealthy, if she was a part of the ruling class, uh, she did have some influence, especially over no negotiating marriages for political alliances. Um, and one of the other kind of really important thing that wealthy women did, um, so they were literate, uh, they kept an archived collections of books. Um, this really helped keep like history together um, because these books were really popular among women. And it also helped shared ideas among upper class women because a lot of time they would like trade books. They'd be like, hey, this book was really great. Go read it, friend. Um, and they also influenced what men read as well. They've been like, oh, husband or son or whatever. Here, read this book. It's really good. Yay, books. All right. So... Uh, they also influenced husbands on certain laws. Uh, this didn't happen very often, um, but there are a few women that did have influence. You'll probably, um, you'll learn about one in the video that we'll watch later in the unit. Uh, they also influenced economy uh, because whatever was kind of like the popular fads of the time, like with um, like luxuries, like gifts, and also like makeup and accessories, um, 
and they would give sometimes they would give these gifts to like other aristocrats as like a present that really influenced the economy of like what's in uh, and also if their parents were wealthy they could get a high position in the church as a nun so young girls um were educated on running the household and how to read and write if they're wealthy. They're mostly taught how to read the Bible and biographies of saints. Uh, so again, really like ingrained with that religion. Uh, women wrote letters to each other's. Most of the time it was like friendship letters, especially because they couldn't like just, you know, pop in a car and go down the road. Like <laughs> you can't just do that. So it was a form of communication. Um, they also wrote letters for invitations and gifts. And the cool thing about writing letters to each other is a lot of them learn foreign languages um, because they could like send these letters over long distances across country borders. Um, women could also send love letters and um, women were also educated in foreign languages, specifically French and Latin. In public, women were expected to take tiny steps because it was considered elegant. Uh, so that's kind of the same concept if you did the Chinese foot binding, um, where like the women can only take little small steps. It was the same concept kind of in Europe, except for they didn't have any like pricking of the feet. Um, at social gatherings, uh, they were expected to talk about their love of dogs, hunting, birds, music, uh, and love. Yes, women actually could go hunting. That was one of like the acceptable things that they could do. Um, and they went alongside men and they typically hunted with falcons, which is like super awesome. Like they're riding horseback, just got like a falcon on their arm. Like, yeah. Uh, they also had to tend to the men. Uh, for example, daughters and knights were expected to bathe male guests that came over to their houses. All right. You are going to write this down in your study guide. Okay. This is question number one. So write this in your study guide. What were the roles of wealthy women? And give at least three examples. Okay. In your study guide, right? All right. So don't write this in your study guide. This is just one I want you to answer on your ed puzzle. Uh, what do you think were the roles of women who were peasants or of the working class? So um, in peasantry, so once they're married, they were expected to manage the household. Um, so that includes like raising the kids, like, you know, all like the daily chores, uh, but also finances. Okay. They, most of the time they're in charge of finances. They're also harvesting fields with men. Um, so working women, so this is outside the peasantry for the few that like were in like bigger towns, they could join guilds and what a guild is and it's association of craftsmen. Um, Typically, the only guilds they were allowed to be in were dress and hat making. They mainly worked in textiles, um, and that would be like spinning wool, sewing, weaving, spinning silk. If a man did not have a job, um, but there was a woman working a job, a woman working that job, she'd immediately get fired, and the man would be put into her place. Um, so yeah, they usually worked in textiles and made beautiful things like silk. Okay, um, but they couldn't afford what they made. So they all pretty much wore just like terrible clothes, um, which were usually like gray and sad. Uh, so they were overworked and underpaid. All right, question two, write this one in your study guide. What were the roles of peasant slash working class women? And give me at least two examples. All right, don't write this one in your study guide. This one, I just want you to answer on the Ed Puzzle. Do you think laws in middle age Europe empowered women or disempowered women? Why or why not? Don't say, I don't know. Like, give me an answer. Come on, think hard. All right. So uh, laws and women, some were super unfair, some were slightly more fair. Um, so women could not inherit land and wealth so they could inherit land and wealth, but they couldn't control it. It had to be controlled by their husband or another male figure. Um, but the husband did have to get, get consent from the wife to sell that land. Um, so not fair, but she had a teeny bit of control. So women could make decisions over the land if a husband was out at war. So 
Um, so an example in 1066, William the Conqueror, who was the king of England, went to war and his wife, Matilda, she was the one who like ran the country um, and like enforcing laws and making decisions over the land while he was off to war. So if a knight or lord went to war and died, um, the wife could inherit the feudal land, um, but the women could not wear bare arms and they could not appear in court without like her brother or her father. Um, husbands were allowed to beat their wives if she was, if she did like a misdoing. If she was innocent, the man was publicly humiliated. Um, and sometimes the wife could just like beat him back, like in the streets, um, if he was lying all about it. So yeah, not a fun time to live in, that's for sure. All right, question three, write in your study guide. What were the laws like in the Middle Ages towards women? Give me at least two examples. All right, so let's talk about women with power. Um, so yeah, there was definitely women with power during this time period. So um, in 900 to 1200 in Salerno, Italy, women were allowed to study medicine, actually. Um, most of the time, these women became midwives, um, which is kind of like a doctor that helps with childbirth. Um, the Byzantine Empire actually had um, a lot of records, medical records about gynecological um, anatomy. Uh, but the only problem was, is in the West, most women could not read Latin. So they'd like get all this great information, but they can't even read it. Um, so Latin was the primary language used in the Byzantine Empire at this time, which is to the East. So for example, there's a Jewish doctor from Marcellus, France. Her name was Sarah, and she took in and trained a male doctor for seven months back in 1326. All right, so there's a ton of women with power. Here's some examples, uh, some such as um, Empress Engelberga, Matilda of Tuscany, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Blanche of Castile, uh, Melissa of Jerusalem, and Joan of Arc. We'll talk about Joan of Arc next semester, actually. Wow, crazy. Um, I'm just gonna go and talk about Eleanor of Aquitaine because um, I thought hers was the most interesting. Well, besides Joan of Arc, but we'll get to her later. All right, so who was Eleanor of Aquitaine? She was actually a French princess. Um, people loved her. She had this really like strong, outgoing personality. She's very charismatic. Her father, who was the king, he died and there were no male heirs. Uh, so she actually inherited the, thr the throne, but she couldn't rule it by herself. She needed like a male to rule it with her. Uh, so she married Louis VIII. Uh, she was about 15, he was about 16. Uh, so Louis the, oh, sorry, I should say eighth, not seventh. Uh, and her uh, went on a crusade. We'll talk about crusades next semester, but what they were, they were like this like religious war kind of thing going on. Um, so they went over to Jerusalem, which is like, you know, the big holy city. Um, so she didn't fight in the war. Um, she just was there to kind of like on the sidelines to observe it all. Uh, she was really involved with whatever her husband was doing. So during the crusade, uh, Louis, this, whatever, King Louis was unhappy with her, um, and he ended up dis divorcing her in 1152. Um, and the reason why that he was so mad at her is because she only gave birth to daughters. Uh, Eleanor was like heartbroken. She's like, what the heck, dude? And so she wanted to go back to France. Um, on her journey back to France, a lot of noble men were like, oh my gosh, if someone marries her, like, we'll become king. Uh, so they attempted to kidnap her and marry her. Uh, so she traveled all the way to Poitiers, France, which at that time was actually under control of England. Okay, so like total rival kingdom. Uh, there she was saved by Duke Henry Plantagenet. I don't know how to pronounce that name, whatever. Okay, so she like literally just fled to enemy territory. She's like, you know what, French people, not dealing with you. I'm going to the English. Uh, that is where she married Duke Henry, and then he would eventually become king of England in 1154. So, okay, remember, whoever she married, 
he would become the king of France. Well, guess what? She married the king of England. So now both the territory that England had and top of that, he also ruled France. So he pretty much became the king of England and France. Uh, this was kind of like revenge for the nobles who wanted to kidnap and marry Eleanor. Um, and together they had five sons. So it wasn't a super happy marriage. Henry was cheating on Eleanor with a mistress. Uh, she got super mad. She fled the castle. That's when her favorite son, Richard the Lionhearted, which I don't know. Are we going to talk about him next semester? I don't know. We'll see. I haven't decided that yet. Uh, he went to battle. Um, and while he was off in battle, she governed his land for four years. So she still held quite a bit of power. Uh, Richard got captured in 1194, and Eleanor paid most of her money to get him freed, um, which is super noble as a mother, I guess, but then she's poor. Uh, so she tried, or she retired to a convent um, and just kind of lived off of the convent's wealth um, and died at the old age of 82, which is like unbelievable for that time period. Like most people died in their 30s. So 82 is like super old. All right, uh, here is a picture of her grave. She has this really famous grave in England. Um, so here's a portrait of her. Uh, she loved books, so that's why she's like reading a book. Um, you can see like they built a coffin statue thingy of her. It's pretty cool. It's a tourist attraction now. All right. Uh, so women and clergy, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm so sorry. There are so many interesting stories about women um, who are nuns or like just part of the whole like Christian religion themselves that had a lot of power. Uh, but if you want to learn more, I can definitely send you some resources. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is like my favorite picture. So it's on a book that I got from the library. This is like the front cover of it. <laughs> It is just so intense. It's just like, oh my gosh. I just think it's so funny. Like the facial expressions on them. It's like they're dancing and she's like, dude, dude, what are we doing here? And then I like like these two back here. She's like, you know what? She's like, you know what, Bob? If we dance another song, I'm going to like take that dagger out and like stab you with it. Like it is so funny. Uh, Middle evil art sometimes is really awesome. All right, onward. All right, so we're going to switch gears here. We're going to talk about Eastern Orthodox Church and the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so we talked about the Byzantine Empire before, okay? Uh, we talked about that. Oh, my gosh. Was that the end of Rome that we talked about that? Yeah, I think so. Um, so Byzantine Empire, they abandoned the western part of the old Roman Empire. So remember, Byzantine Empire was supposed to be like some sort of like continuation of the Roman Empire, but it just didn't work out. Um so the reason why they abandoned the western part of the old roman empire was because there was too many germanic or like local tribes trying to take over the west um and the byzantine empire just did not have the force to maintain it uh, so but the byzantine empire they just like up and left rome and the pope behind who's the religious leader of christianity uh so they can still consider themselves a part of the roman empire or like a continuation of it um, but they did betray, they were betrayed by Pope Leo when he crowned Charlemagne as the Roman Emperor in 18 or in 800, as we learned about in a previous lesson. So they're a little bit bitter between like the West and the East. Uh, so here's a map of the Byzantine Empire about 1024. You can see here that they take most of what like Croatia and what we call Greece today. Um, around the Black Sea and then here into what is like modern day Turkey um, at that time is Anatolia. Um, so that was pretty much the Byzantine Empire's land. Uh, they did have a little piece of Italy, but Rome is up here towards the north a little bit more. So they did not have Rome. Um, and then, of course, the Western Empire was not a part of the Byzantine Empire or the Western countries were not a part of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, OK. Um, so let's talk about the Byzantine Empire a little bit. Uh, so they were ruled by an emperor or an empress. They were not fractured into a bunch of little kingdoms like the West was, okay? They were like a unified whole. They did not have feudalism until about the mid 800s. Uh, and what happened is the reason why they got feudalism is because the economy was so bad um, that poor farmers couldn't afford their land anymore. So they had to like sell it to the nobles so they could like rent it back 
It's sad. Um, so the Byzantine Empire tried to stop feudalism at one point because they like saw it in the West. They're like, oh my gosh, this is like terrible for the peasants. Um, so Emperor Ra Romanus the first signed the law in 1922 and then again in 1935 to ban feudalism. Um, but after his death, uh, the Byzantine Empire went back to feudalism. So there was frequent contact between Western Europe and the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so for example, the Byzantine prince, Romanus II, he married a noble from Italy in 944. There's also a lot of exchange of ideas, like I said before, medical texts, as well as historical texts um, and technologies. For example, paper making was introduced um, from the Islamic rule in Spain. Um, in the 1000s, um, and then also along the Silk Road. Um, so it kind of comes on two different sides that that paper making technology came about. So both of them had to fight a lot of foreign rivals. Um, so both had to fend off of a large Umayyad Caliphate. Um, so that's, if you remember the Caliphate, it's like the Islamic kingdom of that time, and that was in North Africa and then up in Spain. Um, and also was kind of coming around into the Middle East. Um, so kind of two fronts, both of them had to fend them off. Uh, the West also fought with each other a lot, especially England and France. They really hated each other. And the Byzantine Empire fought off Bulgars and Turks, uh, which is in what modern day Turkey is too. They're like local tribes that try to take the Byzantine Empire over. All right, so you see here, uh, here's the Umayyad Caliphate. Um, so you can see it take over Spain, all of Northern Africa, all of the Middle East. So this, the Umayyad Caliphate was just gigantic. Um, I don't think we're gonna to talk too much about it, which I feel really bad about, but we'll talk about the Ottomans. All right, so the splitting of the churches, this is one of the big things that really distinguished the West part of Europe and then the East part of like Europe, AKA the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so when Constantine reigned in 306, uh, um, and between that and to 1054, the Catholic or the Christian church was united uh, for both the West and the Byzantine Empire. Okay, so they had like the same church, like mostly the same rituals, same structure, Pope was the head of it. Um, and then this thing called the Great Schism happened in 1054. And that's when the church split into two. Okay, that is where in the West, um, it became Roman Catholic with their capital in Rome, Italy. And in the East um, is the Eastern Orthodox. So that would be the Byzantine Empire. Um, and they had their capital in Constantinople, which is today Istanbul, Turkey. Um, and to this day, that is still the same way. Okay, they're still Roman Catholic and they're still Eastern Orthodox. Okay, it's split into two. All right, so here's kind of a map of the Great Schism, as you can see. Um, so in the West, it's Catholic. In the East, it's Orthodox. Uh, so there's four main reasons why the church split back in 1054. Uh, the first one is we talked about already, Pope Leo, he's crowning Charlemagne in 800, and that was seen as treason in the eyes of the Byzantine Empire. Number two, uh, this seems like what the heck? Uh, but yeah, it was like a really big deal. It's the use of unleavened bread. What unleavened bread? If it's, um, if it's unleavened, it means that it doesn't have yeast. Um, at communion, um, which is one of the holy sacraments. So the West didn't want any yeast in their bread for communion and the East wanted yeast. <laughs> I know it's like really yeast. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's a big deal even to this day. Um, so three, the wording of the Nicene Creed. If so what the Nicene Creed is, I think I talked about him or about the Nicene Creed briefly with Constantine, uh, but it's the declaration of what specifically Christians believe in. Um, that would be like the three parts of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus being born in the Virgin Mary, and then Jesus crucified, died, and rose to heaven. It was like this big declaration. It's a big deal uh, to Christianity. Um, and there are some kind of disputes over the wording of it. That was one of the other big reasons why it split. Um, oh, here's the Nicene Creed right now. That's the English translation of it. Um, and then four, if if a priest should be married or not. That was the other really big debate. Um, so in Eastern Orthodox, um, there's some limitations, but 
overall they say yes that priests can be married but in roman catholicism they say no they cannot all right so to this day there is still a split in the roman catholics and eastern orthodox uh, you can find both of these religions across the globe they are not just like exclusively split into east and west anymore uh, their leaders are also in a lot more friendly terms um, so the leader of Eastern Orthodox, um, like the title the leader is given, it's called the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople. So that's the leader of the Eastern Orthodox and the Pope uh, is the title for the leader of the Roman Catholics. Um, and then I kind of put this up here now. Um, so here is the current um, leader of the Eastern Orthodox. So this is Bartholomew the first. Um, here's the leader of the Roman Catholics. That's Pope Francis. Um, and then you can even see this in your communities today. So for example, um, Roman Catholic churches in Rogers is Mary Queen of Peace. There's the Cathedral in St. Paul, um, the Church of St. Andrew and Elk River, that's Roman Catholic. Um, and then you can find Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox churches in Minneapolis or in Minnesota too. Most of them are kind of more centered into the Minneapolis. Uh, for example, here's St. Michael's Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Minneapolis. <sighs> All right, Whew, we went through a lot. So question four, write this in your study guide in three to four sentences or bullet points, whichever. Summarize the differences between Western Europe and Byzantine Empire and why the Catholic Church split into the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox churches. All right, so wrap up. We talked about the roles of women. Um, we talked about wealthy women, peasants in the working class, laws of women's Eleanor of Aquitaine, and this difference in similar similarities between Western Europe and the Byzantine Empire, also the Great Schism. Uh, so heads up, I'll email you before you probably watch this video, but a good reminder, this is my last Ed Puzzle lecture video of the semester. Aren't you all lucky? Um, so all late and missing work is due January 24th at midnight. There are no exceptions. You can't be like, oh, Miss Corey, I have one more assignment coming on the 25th. I'll be like, nope, it's already a zero. Bye. Um, I need to get my grades in by the 26th. So the 24th is the absolute latest period. Done. No buts about it. Great. All right, so I'm leaving January 20th, 23rd, and 24th open for you to get caught up with work and slash study for your final test. I'll be also opening up about two or so um, extra credit assignments that week if you want some extra credit. Uh, your test will be posted on the 25th and 26th. You must complete the test on either the 25th or the 26th. No exceptions. If you do not do it, then it is a zero. All right, so next up, you are going to complete U7L7, Women's Writing in the Middle Ages. After that, you're going to do the U7L8, L9, and L10, History Channel, The Dark Ages. I just split the whole video documentary up into three parts, so that's why it spans over three lessons. Uh, answer those questions on your study guide. Do the review Kahoot. That is optional. I'm not grading that, but I will tell you right now, it is very helpful for this test. Um, and then you're going to take the Unit 7 test, okay? If you have questions or comments or want to learn more, you're more than welcome to email me or come to office hours. Yay. All right, that's it. Bye.